use, which is resident marginal cost pupil unit. Okay, well, all that means is that it's the number of resident students we have in our district. We're based, you know, referendum money that we're talking about, levy money, is based on resident students regardless of where they attend. And you can see the resident marginal cost people unit is going down, down, down. And so regardless of where, it, that's a population. A population is going down in our district. Resident kids are going down. Okay. This is the revenue that goes down the amount lost because of the resident pupils. Just we just don't have as many resident pupils. This is what's going down here. Now, the formula for that is right here. It's 23% of your prior year resident pupils plus 77%, and there's some other stuff that goes on in that formula. Diane, I don't know if you... That's basically it. You take the prior year, you multiply by 23%, and add 77% of this year. And the state has come up with that formula to help offset declining enrollment or declining residents. It goes down a little bit slower now. Second area that we that we're concentrating on is our fixed costs. The costs of this game are the same regardless of our student enrollment. Okay, and the analogy I use, I use two of them. One is our textbooks. When we are ordering new textbooks for our kids, they don't come in and say, oh, you're declining enrollment at South Elementary, you're declining enrollment in North Elementary, we're going to give you a break in your textbooks which they did, but they don't. Okay? They're, those textbooks cost the same or more regardless of how many, how many kids we have. Okay? We don't have control over the vendor costs. Okay? If we have less kids in the building, we still, we still have to heat it. All of those things that remain the same. Okay? That's, that, is what it, that is what it is. Um, our maintenance costs, we're proud of our three facilities that we have in our district. We're proud of our district. We want to be able to main that, maintain them. But those costs are, are the same or rising regardless of the number of students we have. Here's our budgets per building. And now we're talking general fund. And when you hear the word general fund, that is basically the biggest pot of money that, that our school district has. We have a couple of other funds that we'll talk a little bit about, but general fund is the big, the checking account, basically, if you will. Um, a couple of things on this slide. You know, one of the, the white elephants in everybody's living room floor is when are we going to close buildings? When are you going to close South Elementary? When are you going to close North Elementary? Um, one of the things we want to point out here is that even if we do close one of the buildings, or both, it's not a complete savings. You don't save $805,000 because if, if we close this building. Students in this building are still going to be educated someplace. Okay? Same thing happens with North. So we're not going to, how much money will we save? I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Would there be a savings? Yes, I believe there would be. Now, the other thing to point out here is the general fund breakdown. Here's where the money goes in all of these different areas. Salaries and benefits account for about 64% okay, up to the general fund expense. That is all custodians, certified staff, non-certified staff, um, administration, I mean, uh, Everybody except food service. Food service has their own their own fund that we will, we will see in a little bit. Transportation. You know, most districts, if they if they own their own transportation or own their own buses, their bus drivers end up being their employees. Our bus drivers are not our employees. We contract with Palmer Bus Service. We pay them. They supply the buses. They supply the drivers. This one is probably a little bit higher than a lot of districts, simply because you look at the span that we cover. We, 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 we have a, a large geographical district, that's who we are, so that's going to be a little bit higher. Okay, supplies, contracted services, extracurricular, that's a big hot button with a lot of people. We hear things like, cut all the extracurricular activities. If you cut all of those, this is the amount of money that we save, which is 4% of our general fund budget. Now, we believe two things. One is that extracurriculars are a valuable part of a, st a student's education. It's, it's, <coughs> it goes, it goes uh, hand in hand with, with learning that goes inside the classroom. We want to be able to provide that. Second thing is, we live in a very mobile society. 
if we believe that if we take away these things, we're going to have kids going to districts where they can find them. It's not like, you know, I'm going to use the analogy for me growing up in Pelican Rapids. If Pelican Rapids would not have had basketball, that's what I like to do, if they wouldn't have had it, I would have gone home to mom and dad and said, I want to go to Fergus Falls, I want to go to Barnesville, I want to go to some place that had it. And my mom and dad would have said, forget it. No, you're not going. But that's changed. We believe that kids and families will go wherever it is that they, to get and find things that they want. Right? Um, and we, we believe that that's a pretty small, small part of the general fund. Third area is funding. General education aid is 51.24 per student. Now you heard me say before, roughly $6,500 per student. There are more revenue streams that are that come into our district that that add on to this. This is the general education aid that we get from the state. You can see the history from 0203, what that number has been, 4601. 4783, 4974, 5124, which it has been for the last three years. And we as a, the superintendents and administration are being told to expect no increase for the next two biennials. Okay. And quite honestly, we'd be tickled pick to have 0% increase and not have something taken over. One of the challenges um, that we have or that, that, that part of budgeting in schools is that our budget needs to be set prior to July 1st. All of our staffing, with our, with our particularly our certified staff, needs to be done by April. Okay. A lot of times we don't find out what that number is going to be until May when the legislative session is over. Now, there are, there are some talk among the, the called the MASA, which is the Minnesota Association of School Administrators, of saying that they're, they are they're, they're thinking about making a proposal to the legislature saying, we will take a $300 per pupil cut, but let us know in January. You start your session, K-12 is now done, take a $300 per pupil cut, that way school districts can plan. I'm not sure if I'm in favor of that. Those are the discussions that are happening um, you know, at, at, at the state associations. Here's a challenge that we've been that we've been wrestling with over the last couple of years. We've always been on a 90-10% shift, and what that means is that we get 90% of the aid in the year that we're going to use it. 10% gets shifted or deferred to the following year. Every year that that's happened, we've had to borrow approximately $700,000 to make up for that 10% to get us through the cash flow. Last year, in 09-10, that 90-10% sh shift became 73-27% shift, which means we only received 73% of the aid that we were going to use it in the year that we needed to. 27% gets shifted to the following year. Result of that, was we needed to borrow three million dollars, three million eighty thousand dollars, to cover that 20, uh, 27 percent shift. Okay. 